Thank you for that prayer. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 28. And the, the, uh, your handout has the, the scriptures highlighted. <clears throat> so we just start with that first part. Uh, let's just dig into it. This is the practical section. You know, he's made some application before, but you know, the last couple of uh, chapters there, well, all of chapter, all of chapter five, you know, and all, all of chapter four up until this point has been doctrine. The first was that last part in chapter four was the rapture, and then right following that, as it ought to, is the day of the Lord. See there how it lays out? He says the rapture in chapter four, and then the very next thing is the day of the Lord. And that's what we studied last time. And so the day of the Lord is really broad. There's a lot of things about it. And so I won't try to teach that all again. But here we go. We're going into the application part. And here, you know, I, I notice <clears throat> if you, when you have your Bibles or whatever, uh, you know, just like these verses, uh, they're very short, you know. Uh, especially that over here where it says, in verse 16 and 17 and 18, it says, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. And so all those are commands. And so every one of these are commands. And Paul put it in uh, the imperative mood. And uh, he's, he's encouraging an action that he's inviting it, us into of something that he does and he wished for every true believer. And you know, and I put this up, you know, I, I think your teacher's book has something like uh, salvation is God honoring lives or something like that. So it is true. It, this is applications about God honoring living. And so I put this up. Holiness shows. It does show. You know, and, and really if, if their spiritual life, wouldn't it show? You know, I know our pastor has been making some pretty bold statements. He made something Sunday morning about, he's mentioned several times, if we never witness, if we never talk about the truth, he says, why do you think you're saved? You remember he said that? And you know, some people might take it, you know, take exception to that. You always have people take exception to anything. But really what I would say is, and I'm quite sure of this, if there is life, there's an evidence of life. Isn't that right, Dr. Jenny? That's right. If there's life, there's an evidence of life. But we all have different personalities. And God has called us all to different things sometimes. Not to the same thing. And we all have different gifts. We don't all have the same gift. You know, some have the gift of getting up in front and presiding or leading, like leading the Word or feeding the, uh, the flock with the Word of God. So... And that's what we're getting into now. So the first thing he wants us to do is to respect certain people. All right, let's just read that. He says, and we beseech you. All right, he's encouraging you into a course of action with himself. We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you uh, in the Lord and and then he says, and to, ad and to admonish you. All right, so we've got three things there about whoever he's talking about. Who's he talking about? He's talking about those who are among you, see, over you. The word over is uh, prohistomy is the Greek word, which means to stand in front. Somebody that stands up in front, all right? That's the word over you. It's not lordship. I mean, it's not, it's not like lording it over you, but the word means one who stands in front of you. All right, that's usually a leader, somebody that's there up front. But it says also, we see the word labor. Now, if you look at that, study that word up, it means exhaustive labor. You know, it's not a nine to five thing, you know. I remember I came in late when I was working with, at the newspaper office one summer. And uh, the editor of the paper, a lady, Mary Kane, in Summit, Mississippi, she ran for governor twice. She was really fiery. And I was late one, one day at work. I was working for her running the printing press. And I came in late on the, during the summer, kind of late. And she said, 
in a sarcastic way, dealer or dollar, a 10 o'clock scholar, you know, and uh, whatever that means. <laughs> but the point is, this is not 10 o'clock scholar stuff. He's talking about laboring greatly. And so that's what that word means. Those who labor with you. You know, Paul labored. We know that. He worked day and night in order to be able to do what he did. And so he says, know them. We'll get to the knowledge in a moment. But he wants you to know something. He wants you to know them which labor among you. Not their names. But what does he want you to know? And I got it down here in, uh, I think it's sub point two. We beseech you to know. So the question is, what is it to be known? What's to be known? And what's to be known is believers need to know and to understand the purpose of God placing certain ones in the church in the position of leadership. We need to know that. In fact, I think that's almost critical to our spiritual growth is for you to recognize someone who's there to teach you and, and to lead you and to guide you in spiritual things. If you don't, you know, guess what? I don't know whether our pastor ever listened to one of these or not. If I was a pastor, I'd be listening to everything I say. But anyway, let's put it this way. I only have one pastor. He's a pastor of this church. I only have one pastor. And, I'm, and what does he need from me? He needs me not to cause any problems. And he needs me to pray for him. He needs a lot of prayer. And so I appreciate prayer too, you know. And each one of you that are teachers, you appreciate the prayer of those in your, who are benefiting from your teaching. But he, that's what he means by no. It means to bring that person into mind, to keep that mind, and also to recognize that person. Not their name, but to recognize them as the one that's standing before you, that's your leader. Now, John, you mentioned that. See, he said, where's the pastors on here? My, you know, my, my title up there is Appreciating the Role of Church Leaders, Especially Pastors. Uh, I think I can get into the pastor in a moment, but the point is, it's, he, he doesn't say pastors. He's talking about those who are taking the leadership in, in groups. Who is that? Well, often it is a pastor. It could be one of you that's a teacher because you're standing up taking a role. You're an elder. That's what the, the scripture would call you an elder because you're taking a role and you're a teaching elder kind of thing without getting into Presbyterianism, you know, because they have different elders and so on. But the point is there are elders. And so he's saying, I want you to know them that labor among you and that's over you. Again, not lording it over you, but it means prohistamine. You see the word pro. It means to stand before you. To be placed in front. And it's in the Lord, right? In the Lord. And to admonish you. What else do they do? They're admonishing you. Now what does that word mean? Let me look it up. I think I have some in the notes. It means to be able to teach, instruct, and sometimes warn. Uh, admonishing can be encouraging someone. It can be teaching with authority. It can be warning. In fact, it's translated that way in our lesson, the word warn. Later on, we'll see that. I'll bring it out when it comes to it. But he said, so we got somebody laboring among us. We got somebody that's standing up in front in the Lord and someone who admonishes us, admonishes you, teaching you or, or whatever. All right, so that's what we got. And then, so that's what he's, he's wanting to recognize that. Now, what does he want to do for that? That's the next phrase. It says, and to esteem them. He wants us to know them and then to do what? And to esteem them. Esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Okay. What does that mean? It means respect. Esteem highly. It means to show respect for their work's sake, you know? And basically what we're saying is believers who are benefiting from the teaching of the Word of God ought to appreciate it. We ought to appreciate the labor that goes into that. Whether it's a te teacher on Sunday morning or whether it's a pastor, that's what we're talking about here. 
Now, to help us understand it a little bit more, let's go down to uh, uh, let's go down to sub point four there. And let me say this: there are many people going into quote full time Christian service. That's something that's happened in the last you know what thirty years or forty years or something. You didn't used to hear that. Somebody was called to preach. Now we've got people going into full-time Christian service. We've got all kinds of people going into, do, and they're doing different things. They're not laboring in the Word, and they're not teaching the Word like this, like Paul's talking about. But I don't, I don't be diminish that, but what I want you to see is that staff workers who labor among us, you know, people have gone into the, the calling of Christian service, but Paul tells Timothy, and this is in Timothy now, Paul tells Timothy, let the elders, there it is now, see that word? Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and in doctrine. All right, that, that helps us understand the one that he wants us to respect, double honor. I have to tell this. Uh, this is a long story. Maybe I shouldn't tell it. But I, I, I was asked to preach a, a whole week meeting at a, a black church years ago. The sergeant who was a pastor of that church was one of our sergeants in the Army Reserve. And I was his chaplain. And he liked what I did uh, for chapel. I had a blackboard up there. and It was a blackboard with a chalk. And I'd go across it and teach for about 40 minutes, for 45 minutes. And he says, will you come and do that at my church? And I said, well, I will. So I met him up in, uh, up in Fairhope in the parking lot up there. And we drove way up, into Bayman, uh, Bay, way up into Baldwin County, some rural area, to a little church that he pastored. And so when I walked in that night, he had had the men go down to the shop at the school, and they built a freestanding chalkboard. And it was right up front, so I could teach that night. So Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, everything's wonderful. Friday night, we finished up the meeting. And I'd never been in a black church, and man, they participate in the service in a lot of different ways. But I really enjoyed it. It was a beautiful experience. And it's about 9 o'clock. We got through, and, and uh, I was riding up there with him on the trip, so he's going to take me back to my house at Fairhope. And he said, uh, one of my brother's friends, pastor in a neighboring church, his, his anniversary, and I'd like for us to run by there. Anniversary. I didn't know what that meant. You, some of you know. And so I said, well, I looked at my wife. I said, well, they're, they're through by now. He said, oh, no, they're just getting started. <laughs> and so we went. I drove up in that little country scene, and there was cars everywhere. Wow. And they were already in there, and you could hear somebody just going at it. He was preaching. And so I got in there. He was a visiting preacher. They had other preachers come and preach. And I told him, I said, let's sit in the back. And oh, he said, follow me. <laughs> so I started right down through that. You know, everybody, they were all in there listening to that man preaching. He's preaching and we're walking down. Everybody, I'm the only white guy, of course. <laughs> and so we go past the deacons. And the, over on the right side, toward the front, uh, rows were sit this way, facing across the church and he shook every hand so I <laughs> shook every hand he walked up to the pulpit on the platform and there was this uh, old pastor uh, he was missing a few teeth he was an old pastor in the most tall back chairs and uh, I said he, they asked me to sit down right beside him and he, they introduced me and I shook his hand this guy's still preaching right over here <laughs> shake his hand my friend that brought me there, he sits down. I sit down in a, in a sit chair there next to that old preacher. And then, you know, they're preaching away. And then all of a sudden, my friend leans over and says, you're next. <laughs> that scared me to death. Be ready in season. That's right. Now, y'all know what an anniversary is. That's where they're raising money for a pastor. You know, it's his anniversary going to raise a lot of money. This is the passage that the Lord put on my heart. <laughs> right there, just read it. I got up there when my time came. I said, let the elders 
that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they that labor in the word and in doctrine. And then I made my points, Tommy. The first, double honor, on the one hand, respect, to esteem him highly. That's just what Paul told us in, that, in our lesson tonight, respect. And the other, the double honor, the other is remuneration. Remuneration. And that's, you know, you're going to give back to him. You know, you support him if he's feeding you, right? And so he, everybody, he loved that. <laughs> because when they got through, and I got through preaching about that, you know, they clapped. And I sat down. And I was through. But I never forget it because, you know, it's true. If he was faithful over the years of feeding that flock, they owed him respect and they owed him some remuneration to help, to help support him. You know, when somebody's supporting you, you should be supporting them, you know. And so I know that we, have all, we all know that Paul would not receive such remuneration himself. He wouldn't do it. And that was okay. He's, he was an apostle and he was setting the foundation. He didn't want any distraction as to the motive of what he was doing. But he does make clear in the scripture that you don't muzzle the ox that treads out, you know, the wheat or the corn or whatever it is. No, he gets to eat of whatever it is. And so now we've developed a lot of professionalism in the church today, which may, I don't think is so good. But uh, it's true that God calls men to devote their lives, whether it's missionaries or whether it's uh, pastors or who, whatever, however you want to say it to devote their lives and their livelihood to the Word of God. And so and they do labor, you know, so on. So that's the point there. And, uh, and then, so the main focus here is on those who labor in studying and teaching the Word of God. And you can compare Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, where Paul tells the church leaders or the pastors, here's what he said, Take heed... Therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. All right? So that's pretty clear there. He wants them to take heed to themselves and to the flock. He's talking to the, these elders, these pastors. Take heed to yourself and then to the flock. You better take care of yourself and not become a castaway, a moral, you know, wreck. Take you gotta care for yourself and then you can care for the for the flock, right? I tell this people all the time in counseling. If you don't take care of yourself, who's gonna take care of your children? Who's gonna be there for, for the people that you that need you if you don't take care of yourself? And same way spiritually, right? And so, take care of yourself, he said, and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, has made you overseer. So the Holy Spirit has appointed that person as the one who stands up. And what do they do when they stand up? They feed the church of God. And that's the church of God which was purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ, right? So the need is great. Uh, the need is great for that because we need sound doctrine because we can expect false teachers and false doctrine. You, you can't ignore it. Well, you have to constantly have solid, sound doctrine, or you're gonna have people who's gonna come in with unbelievable you know, uh, teachings and so on. And so you can expect, and Paul did, and Jesus did, expect false teachers, people who would lead you astray, who will oppose the grace message. As Acts chapter 20 and verse 29 through 32, I just read the verse 32. He says, when he got through talking to them, y'all remember that, it's the elders at, at uh, Ephesus came down to Miletus and met Paul on his way to Jerusalem and he told them, you'll never see my face again. You know, they fell on him, they kissed him, you know, they, they bowed, they, they wept. He was leaving them. But he was leaving them with a word of grace. He was leaving them with a message of grace to go back to those churches because they were representing those churches. Here's what he said. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up 
and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. That's awesome. And that's what we have. We have that word of grace that can build you up and give you an inheritance. And let me make this an inference. A pastor teacher who studies and who devotes himself to the grace message and preaches that message is the key to your spiritual growth. And so that's why it's so important for the pastor to be doing that very thing and to be protected from a lot of foolishness, you know. And, you know, I got deacons in here. Deacons are supposed to be a perimeter of protection for the pastor so that he has the time to do the things that's important and not be spending himself with all this stuff that has no meaning for any of us spiritually, okay? That's the way it is. <laughs> okay, so uh, we want to leave our pastor so that he has time to study the Word because we want to grow. We want to be built up on Sunday morning or Wednesday night. And you guys that teach, you're doing the same thing because you're elders and you're teaching and you're imparting something that builds people up and gives them an inheritance. We don't have an inheritance apart from being built up in the faith. It's not the carnal believers that win anything at the judgment seat of Christ. It's the, stru the strong believer, the mature believer. Press on toward the, high, the mark of the high calling, forgetting those things from behind. And so we have that, we're moving forward. Uh, new heights I'm gaining every day, still pressing on. Remember that hymn? Uh, so pressing on. All right, so in number five there, Peter had a word to say about this. You know, I don't usually bring Peter into this. You know why? I don't like to superimpose on any author of the scripture on another author. We don't need, I don't need Peter telling me what Paul is saying. You know, we don't. I don't need you telling me what Paul says. Uh, well, let's let Paul say what he said. But Peter did say something along the same lines, so I think it was very helpful that we can bring in Peter now for a little witness. So Peter said this. He exhorted leaders. That would be leaders in the Jewish, in Judaism, who had turned to Christ. They, they were leaders. He called them elders. He says, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. See, Peter didn't call himself an apostle there even. He called himself an elder who also am an elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and also partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Does that sound familiar to you? Remember 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. Do I have to put it on the board? Remember the suffering and then what happened? And the glory that shall follow. That's what the prophets taught. They always taught that. The suffering and the glory that would follow. I'll put it on the board. <laughs> Here's the suffering. And then over here is the kingdom, you know. And that's the glory. He comes in glory, in great, great power and great glory. There's a lot of things in between here, you know, we know. We got 2,000 years here ourselves, you know, we just put that here. And there's a lot of things here, and there's a lot of things here, and really bad stuff called the tribulation. But then he comes back, you know, right here. And so the scripture says in Hebrews, for the joy set before him, here's the joy, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, is set and, and is set down at the right hand of God the Father. The Father is wrong, right here. So here's the, here's the suffering. There's the glory that's upon What did Peter say? Let me read, go back to Peter now. Peter said, I am an elder, and I'm a witness of the what? I'm a witness of the suffering of Christ. Peter watched this. He saw it. And then he says, and also I'm a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. That's still future, isn't it? Isn't that good? And, and pencil in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. Because that's the summation of what the prophets taught. The prophets taught, taught two things. The suffering of the Messiah and the glory that would follow. Here you have the suffering and then you have the blessing here on Israel and the kingdom that God had promised David, King David, as the, and Jesus as the greater son of David. He's going to reign on the earth one day. Okay. All right, that's Peter. Let me read the rest of it. 
and the partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. And so what is he telling them now? You elders, feed the flock of God. There it is. How do you feed them? Feed the flock of, not, you know, potato chips and Kool-Aid. All right. Feed the flock of God, which is among you. Doing what? Taking the oversight thereof. Oversight. That's the person standing up. Being an overseer, see? But now Peter adds something that we really need to hear. Taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, not for money, not for the gain of it. You know, I, I, well, I want to be a preacher so I make a lot of money. Well, I don't think you can, but boy, when I went into the ministry, you sure couldn't. You know, the deacons always would keep you humble, you know. <laughs> Uh, not for filthy lucre, right? Okay. But of a ready mind. And look at this one now. I should have had this underlined. Neither as being lords over God's heritage. You know, the believers that make up local churches, that's the heritage of God. That's not my stuff. It's not about me. It's not about you. You know, somebody told me not too long ago, one of the happiest things in, in your life can be when you come to realize it's not about you. Life's not about you. It's about Him. And God's heritage right there. His heritage. Neither as being lords over God's heritage. You know, Jesus taught His disciples to be servants. Not to lord it over people, but to be a servant. And then He says, but being examples, see that? Being examples to the flock. And so... The requirement that he's asking in this first opening verses is of respect. The requirement of respect is that the leader labors in the Word of God. This means that their labor in the Word of God should be appreciated by those who benefit from his ministry. But I, I'm going to say it to you one more time. He says, know them. Do you know your pastor? Or do you have a bunch of preachers that's doing all the preaching for you? And you don't recognize anybody. You know, we, we need a pastor who will teach the word authoritatively so we can sit there and learn. You know what I like about it? I like the verse by verse. I can sit up there and listen to anybody if they'll go verse by verse. But I'm not listening to anybody. I'm listening to our pastor going verse by verse. You might not always agree. You go verse by verse. Let's find out if he's teaching John. Let's find out what John wrote. If he's teaching Paul, let's find out what Paul wrote. And you can't go too bad if you just stay in the verse and go verse by verse. Word upon word, line upon line, precept upon precept. If you do that, you've got a good chance of getting it. Right? But these preachers now, not ours, but there's preachers who preach uh, topical messages. They choose a subject. All right, Jones, you know, it's better better late than never. I didn't know my grandson was saying all night. Thank you, excuse me. But you know, you're teaching topical messages. So I choose, I'm gonna, okay, I'm going to preach on, you know, give a subject. And then I go get a few verses that kind of go with it. And then I get up there and expound on what I want to do, what I, what I want to say. Maybe I'm going to get on to somebody or maybe I'm going to challenge you to do something. Maybe I'll pick out giving money you know, or tithing or whatever it is. And I'll pick out a few things and I'll teach it out of context. And that's dangerous. It is dangerous. Now some people can do a great job and be right on, right in there, you know. I, they don't pull it out of context. They might teach a sub subject and that'd be good. But there's a lot of danger in somebody grabbing up the scripture and just declaring something that they made up. So one thing is called exegetical teaching. Verse by verse. Hermeneutics, it means it's the science of biblical interpretation, verse by verse. You know, the Bible actually says something. It says it in context. It says it grammatic, grammatically. You know, it does say it. If nothing else, just read the sentence and, you know, di diagram it and see if you see what it's saying. What is it saying? That's the first step, you know. But, uh, you know, when a pastor gets up line on line, verse by verse, like our pastor does, uh, he's got to exegete it. He's got to bring out the meaning. You know, having studied, he's got to bring out the meaning. And you know what I say about, you know, some, some of these Bible classes where they say, they give out, they read a little verse, and they say, now, Sybil, what do you think? 
Well, Sybil hadn't thought about it until now. And she, but she'll give you her opinion. We know that. If somebody asks me, I have a grandson. He's, he's a freshman at, at Sanford University. And for years and years, when he's a little old boy, you can ask him any question you want to. And he'll tell you the answer. If he, he'll make it up. He'll explain to you how anything happens. Whether it's something in genetics or medicine or whatever it is. He'll explain it to you. He might not know one thing about it, but he really, uh, he, 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 he flourishes, you know, with words. So he's going to be a politician. <laughs> Maybe so. Mm -mm. No, I hope not. Okay, so I hope I hadn't belabored that too much. But, yeah, I'm just saying, let's be appreciative of somebody who does pay the price to teach the Word of God. There is a price to be paid. You know, you've got to give up your time. For You've got to say no to good things. I mean good things. Wonderful things. You've got to say no. You've got to spend some time. But the man that spends time with God, guess what? It's going to show when he gets up and preaches. It'll show. His profiting will, will be seen by all people when he has studied with the Lord. Been alone with the Lord, and then you get... You get that. So that's a good good point. So the great and then another thing under here is verse thirteen B. The greatest way number seven there, under there, a little sub point under my outline. The greatest way to show respect for a leader is to avoid causing trouble in the congregation. <laughs> Therefore Paul said, And be at peace among yourselves. You see, now I'm gonna go back just for a minute. In verse in verse twelve up there, it said of that leader that he has to admonish you. Now, some people don't like to be admonished, you know, because it might be a correction or a warning. And we don't, sometimes we don't like that. So if people don't like it, guess what they do? They start gossiping, they start running somebody down, you know. And Paul says, and be at peace among yourselves. And he call, he's calling us to, to, you know, to be kind and, be patient and be forgiving. You know, and really I ask you to do that with me because I don't have time to say all the things I would like to say. So I skip over a lot of things. Thinking you already know it, you know. And you, you have to go back and study and I just encourage you to go get it. Read these scriptures for yourself. Ponder it. Pray over it. That's how we learn. Alright, so he says, And be at peace among yourselves. Now, in verses 14 through 15, it gives us four specific responsibilities of church leadership. Now, the way I've studied this, different, here's two different views about this before we read these four things. Is this something pastors should do, or is this for everybody in the church? And, and, and my belief is it's for those who are leaders as well as, you know, it's, a, it's addressed to all of us. We all can do this, all right? So let's look at it. Verses 14 through 15 gives four specific responsibilities of church leaders or leadership. Number one, warn them that are unruly. All right? That word warn there is the word for admonish. It's the same word, admonish. But warn them that are unruly. That word means, unruly means uh, not in order or disorderly. It's a military word. You know, when I was in the military, we had to march. And when you're marching, if you step out, if you get out of step, that's this word. Those who are out of line. You're getting out of line, you know. And so warn them that get out of line. All right. Uh, the unruly is one who is out of step with the word of God and therefore causes problems in the local church. And every church has these people, believe it or not. They all do. No church is without these people. You don't need to be one of these people. You know, we don't need to be that way. It's ugly when people like that, you know, when, when people get in fights in churches. That's why you have so many Baptist churches. They split and they went somewhere else. Over a little stuff like that, you know. And so when you get out of line, so how do you know we're in line? The only way we could ever know would be God's Word. God's Word. All right, so the second thing is comfort the feeble-minded. 
Now that word literally feeble minded, the word the Greek word there is small soul. Having a small soul. But today it would indicate believers who may have lost heart. You know, when somebody loses heart, it's it's not about being retarded or anything. It means uh, you know, you lost heart. You know, you you've lost that excitement of the soul. Uh, the loss of heart, you're grieving a loss. That's what he's talking about. So to comfort that person means to, the word comfort is the word para kaleo. Kaleo means to call to another person. And para means alongside yourself. You call them to come alongside yourself. Put your arm around them. You walk with them in, in whatever their, their, their burden is right now because they've lost heart. And, and you know, and the thing is, if we would do this for every person, it, it, think about it. I, I can say that I can probably think about some people who have lost heart and they're no longer coming to our church. I can think of, of people who, you know, might have got out of step and they're no longer coming to our church, you know, whatever. Or somebody got out of step and drove them away. And so, you know, every person needs to be reclaimed. And he says, support the weak. Now this word weak refers to one who is too weak to stand up on his own. That's what that Greek word means. And so today believers are, uh, are weak in the faith. The ones who are weak in the faith need the stronger brother or sister to help. Perhaps someone needs, perhaps everyone, I, I type this in, perhaps everyone needs a support group. You know, in my work, you know, we try to get people support groups, you know, if you got a real problem, sometimes you can't handle it on your own. You need a support group. And so perhaps all of us need support groups. And perhaps maybe the local church is the support group that God designed for every one of us to be here, to be a part of that. And uh, you're functioning. But see, you need the strength of the other person too. You know, I'm not the strong one. I need the strength of the other person. You're not the strong one. You need the strength of the other person. And God has made it that way so we are connected. He doesn't want any mavericks running around thinking, okay, look at me, the cock of the walk. Oh. And there's there can be some preachers like that too. You know, you can usually pick them out pretty quick. But no, we're, we're knitted together in the body of Christ. We're knitted together and we need each other. That's real important. And Paul said all. You know, we've had that in the lessons last week. He wants all. All to be ministered to. Not just if we lose one or two. If you've got, if you've got a thousand people, if you lose you know, for three or four hundred, you don't care. You're going to get two or, two or three hundred more in a few more years. You just let them go. No, we, we're supposed to be caring about each and every one. The weak the feeble-minded, whatever it is, the ones who lose heart. Uh, sometimes people lose a loved one and you don't see them. Or some terrible thing happens in their family and you don't see them. You understand it'll be for a while, but sometimes they don't ever come back. We need to be aware of that, I think. Now, pastors, should pastors be doing this? Yeah. Uh, should church members be doing this? I think well, based on your gifts, based on where you are spiritually, yeah, you know. And then number three, support the weak. We talked about that. Number four, be patient with all. And that's one we can all do. The word all. You see that? Paul said, be patient with all. And this is the work. Now look, this is the work of the Holy Spirit that is so important in dealing with all kinds of people. Now listen to me real quick. The pastor has to deal with all kinds of people. You know, you don't have to like everybody. You know why? Everybody don't like you. There's people that don't like you. There's people who don't like me. And that ought to be okay. You know, you don't have to like everybody. But you've got to have the compassion of the Lord. You've got to have that kind of love for people. For, for other people. And he says, be patient. Now, that's something he's asking us to do. Be patient. Be patient with all. And I wanted to say this to you. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. 
that's so important in dealing with all kinds of people, people who are struggling, right, and people who are opposing themselves. Now, I studied this scripture that I'm about to quote to you, and from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 and 26, Paul is talking to Timothy, who's a pastor, or who is an apostle, a delegated apostle from Paul. And he's dealing with all kinds of people in the church. And here's what Paul had to say to Timothy about being patient. Okay, now watch this. It's, it's in the bold print there. Here's what he says. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. I'm going to stop there just for a minute. See that? Who's he talking to? Well, he's talking to about, uh, he's talking about servants of the Lord uh, who have to have the ability to teach. And he said, you need to be patient. You need to be gentle in your teaching. And then he says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If Jack Fitz was here, I'd say that's the billy goats he used to talk about. Remember that? He used to talk about the billy goats. They're the ones who want to but. You know, you said this, but. Oh, he said that, but. You know. They oppose, they oppose themselves. If you're in a position where you're, you're the critic of God's Word, you're in trouble. You're opposing yourself, and it's so easy for Satan to just trap you so easy. And that's what he said. They oppose themselves, and he says, be gentle with them, be patient, teach them. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who, have, who are taken captive by him at his will. It's so easy for Satan to take you captive when you want to butt against the truth. Right? There it is, right there. And so this is my this is my sort of my motto verse in, in all in the counseling that I do. Because I'm I'm gonna be a teacher ultimately in a process. First I'm gonna listen. I gotta find out the person's let that person reveal himself to, to me. And if whatever there's a problem, then I, I wind up teaching some things. But I'm praying, I'm, I'm waiting for God to do a work to turn that heart, to turn that life. And that's the word repentance, right? And peradventure, it says peradventure, that word means it, it, it's likely that God might do this, but not too likely. That's what the word means, peradventure. It's not a guarantee. But if God peradventure will give them repentance, that means a turning of the mind, right? Changing of the mind. Uh, turning, their, turning them toward what? Acknowledgement of the truth. You know, it, if you don't acknowledge the truth, you're not going to solve your problem. You know, because the truth is what brings us freedom and, and, and brings it, sets us free and brings us the growth that we want, the joy, the peace. You know, acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover. This is recovering. You ever heard of recovery? whether it's uh, from alcoholism or from sex addiction, you know, whatever it is, I don't care. Recovery. This is how anyone recovers. This is a, this is a model for recovery ministry. Somebody's got to love them. Somebody's got to be gentle and kind. Somebody's got to tell them the truth, to teach them the truth, and then pray a lot that maybe God will turn their heart toward the truth. And when they turn toward the truth, they can recover themselves. You can't recover anyone. But they can recover themselves if God gives them repentance. That's what he says. And then otherwise, they're in the snare of the devil. You know? Somebody says, well, we need to cast out demons out of this person. Well, you might need to, but you're not going to do it. There's a way it's done. But it's called the teaching method. There's a power method where these guys come in, they're the power they go and throw the demons out, and there's teaching method. And when you preach the gospel, or you teach the word of grace, I guarantee you, when God works, there's not going to be any bondage, because He sets people free. But it takes that word of God that sets us free. You know? 
the old hymn, there's power in the blood. Wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. All right. Now, the last thing that subpoint nine there I got in my outline. Now this is verse 15, which incidentally I didn't print up at the top. <laughs> I missed it, but I printed it right here. So this is verse 15. You might notice it's verse 15. You might, you know, write that in. But here's the warning. He says, see that none render evil for evil. So people, listen, I put in here, because I remember this one, one man told me this one time. He's a deacon, actually. He says, I don't forgive, I get even. That's what he told me. Now, he didn't like something I did. He said, I, I don't forgive, I get even. Have you ever heard that? Anybody ever heard that? Oh, y'all have heard it too. All right. So people who cannot forgive, who don't forgive, and they're always the self-righteous religious type. Because I found that broken people or humble people or normal people, they, they, they can let things go and they live and let live. But these self-righteous types, oh boy. Yeah, they're not going to turn loose. People who won't forgive, they tend to get even. And Paul says, don't render evil for evil. So the believer who applies the word of God in doing good will build up the body of Christ instead of tearing it down. And the tearing it down would be rendering evil for evil. I'll get even with you. It's vengeance. What does the scripture say about that? Ven the Lord says what? Vengeance belongs unto, unto the Lord. I will repay. So what I do in my counseling all the time, I tell these people, I look, that person has drove a dagger in your heart and you're hurting and you're, it's hurting. Now what are you going to do? To pull that dagger out and go after them or pull the dagger out. It hurts, but it can heal though. We're going to pull it out. We're going to put it in God's hand. Now, who are they responsible to now? God. That's what you want to do. Otherwise, you're in the middle between God and that person. And you don't want to be there. With what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. Let it go. Don't render evil for evil. Now, evil there, it means hurt. Something that has to do with Satan's plan. Uh, you know, something like revenge or hurt or any kind of uh, evil, any kind of bad omen or whatever. And so he says, and then, then Paul adds this at the bottom of the page. He says, but every, but, but every, I guess it's everyone, follow that which is good, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and church members, and also extend it to who? Everybody, and we need community. There's community. Let's turn the page. Verses 16 through 21. Here I am. I'm getting. Oh boy. <laughs> Verses 16 through 21. And here's what I tell you, teachers. You can't teach all this in, on Sunday morning. Pick out something that really speaks to you, and bring it across. You know, they have their quarterly, but something that really speaks to you. And here's one of them that really speaks to you now. This section here, verses 16 through 21. Rejoice evermore. Well, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You want to know what the will of God is? Somebody says, well, I'm just waiting around to know the will of God. Well, there's a, in, in Thessalonians, he says the will of God is that you avoid fornication. That's in chapter 1 or 2 or whatever it is. And here's the will of God, that you rejoice. He said in the command, imperative mood, rejoice. You remember he said that in Philippians, rejoice, and again I said that you rejoice. Uh, rejoice, pray without ceasing. Part of prayer is giving thanks. Give thanks for everything. Wow. If I give thanks for everything, that means that I'm not angry because God gave me less. You know, I'm looking around at everybody else. Feel sorry for myself because God didn't give me good looks. <laughs> Or whatever. <laughs> what do you What are you worried about? You know, what do you feel like you're short on? You know, everybody's short on something. But you know, you get teenagers, which I see often in my my work, and you know, a teenage girl don't like anything. They look in the mirror; they always find something wrong. Give thanks for all things, except how God has gifted you, how He's blessed you, and realize that He's going to heal your body one one day. Not any time soon, Ronnie. Uh, John Piper had a sermon 
when is Christ going to heal my body? And he answered that when he comes back. That's when we get healed. You're not getting healed in the meantime. All right, now the rest of them, here's one. Quench not the spirit. Now, you know, the, the word quench. And then there's another one where Paul says, grieve not. Quench not and grieve not. Grieving God, the Holy Spirit, is when you're going on in sin. You're grieving the Holy Spirit. You're refusing to turn. You're living in the sin. You're in this some kind of bondage. That's grieving the Holy Spirit. You see, we've been commanded to do what? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. We quote that sometimes in here. He says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So God, it's His will that we be filled with the Holy Spirit. To do that, we must avoid this. Quenching the Spirit and grieving the Spirit. But grieving the Spirit has to do with sin. Quenching the Spirit has nothing to do with sin. I'll give an example real quick of quenching the Spirit. God told, told Jonah to go to Nineveh, the capital of Syria, the, capital of Syria, the enemy of Israel. <laughs> And Jonah said, oh, I'm not going up there. And God said, if they don't repent, they're going to hell. And then, you know what Jonah said? Let them go to hell. <laughs> he went down to Joppa, got aboard the boat, and he took off in a different direction, right? He's not sending. He's quenching the Spirit of God. He's, he's refusing to do what God wants him to do. So you can be in sin, and God's not real pleased with that because you're... You're giving up your joy, your peace in Christ, all the fruits of the Spirit through your work of the flesh. See, Galatians, work of the flesh, fruit of the Spirit. So you're giving up the fruit of the Spirit for the work of the flesh when you're grieving. But quenching is when God is you walking with the Lord and Tommy, he points you in a certain direction for ministry and you say, oh Lord, I don't do that. You know, he might be calling you to do this or that, be here, be there geographical will of God, whatever it is, the operational will of God, and you, like Jonah, decides you're not going to do it. That's, that's quenching the Spirit. I don't have a lot of time with that. But that's it. He says, quench not the Spirit. The Spirit wants to lead you and guide you. And if I quench the Spirit, I'm just putting down the Spirit. I'm not following Him. And then it says, despise not prophesying. Let me read you what I put on that. That's subpoint three. And I said... Despise not prophesying means to be open to receive the ministry of the Word of God. At this time, when Paul wrote this, the canon of Scripture was not formed, was it? Because this was the first book in the whole canon of Scripture. So the Scripture wasn't there except for the Old Testament. It was important for believers not to despise the genuine prophecies that were being given through Paul and other legitimate prophets of this early beginning. There were New Testament prophets, not Old Testament prophets. There were New Testament prophets who were in that assembly who would stand up and give a word. There was no scripture. They didn't read scripture until we got this first book. All right, so he said, don't despise that. Now today, what would that mean? Oh, oh, don't let somebody stand up in our service on Sunday morning and say, I got a prophecy and start prophesying over the whole group. The pastor should protect us from that, but I'm out of here. See, that's that's not going to be in our present time. But today it would apply to your attitude toward the preaching of the Word of God, the ministry of the Word of God. Do you love it? There it is. Do you love it? Do you love it? You ought to. John Piper was saying, yo, you made decisions for God? He says, how wonderful, but you don't delight in God. Why do you think you're a Christian? You don't delight in God. Oh, I made a decision. That don't mean one thing. You don't delight in God. You don't delight in His Word. If there's life, there ought to be some evidence of it. Maybe we talked about that. Okay, there it is. The next thing is prove all things. Hold fast to what that which is good. Prove all things. It's the Greek word dokimazo. Dokimazo means to test, like testing a metal to see what it, the metal is. Examine a thing for the sake of approving it. So false prophecies were common in that day. It's no different today. And there are all kinds of false teaching and people are flocking to it. Really, for sure. 
Look at that now. The word of God, rightly understood, is the only means of holding fast that which is good. And all things must be judged by the light of God's word. Second Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 says this. This ought to be motto of every Baptist. <laughs> Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And now we finish up. We just got a few minutes. Verse 21 through 24 is the way of holiness. I would say, you know, that, that Roman numeral 2 there, the main thing there for me would be the quenching the Spirit. If you wanted to pick out something. In this next part, the main thing is verse 23. But he says, abstain from all appearance of evil. And then you start verse 23. He says, and the very God, well, the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That means completely. And I pray, this is Paul's prayer for you and me, I pray that God, your whole spirit and your soul and body be preserved, blameless, under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, you know what that is. When does the Lord come? At the rapture. When do we get a new body? When does He heal our body? At the rapture. This corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. That takes place when? When he comes, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see it? Remember in, in Thessalonians, in every chapter, he has a reference to the coming of the Lord Jesus. And there it is, right there. And so that's called the ultimate sanctification. Let's go through that real quick. Uh, the sub point two there. Uh, one can learn to discern what is good or evil through the application of the principles of Scripture. Let, let me skip on down. Uh, we don't have time for that. Go to number four. Sub point four. This is the ultimate expression of God's intention for each one of us. The time is at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at the rapture. First Thessalonians 4. And at that time, look at that. At that time, the ultimate sanctification includes our body as well as our spirit and soul. We are, we are made ready for heaven and life with Him. What? He wants, He prays that you're, you'll be sanctified in your spirit, soul, and body in that order. Spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit's born again. Your soul is being renewed and, and, and being purified. And at the rapture, your body will be healed. It'll be renewed. You'll have a new body. All right, now, and then one more thing. Maybe I quoted Unger. And incidentally, Unger, <laughs> Unger, if you want a good Bible study book, uh, it's just a simple Bible handbook. Merle Unger. Unger Bible Handbook. I recommend it highly. I've got the one he did 50 years ago, and I just bought the, le the, the newest one. You know, but it's a good one. It's got a lot of archaeological things in it, and he, got, he gives great outlines on things. You know, so I quote him sometimes. Here's what he said on this passage. He says, God effects sanctification. What did our scripture say? Faithful is he who calls you who will also do it, right? Who, who effects sanctification? Sanctification. God affects sanctification. It's not about you. You can't do it. He does it. And so he goes on and says, He guarantees that our past unchangeable position as complete in Christ and thereby makes certain our future glorification. Salvation, sanctification, glorification. It's for sure. All right, you see that. And then, yeah, I, I kind of skipped over Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. I love this. I remember preaching this when we were in the desert in Saudi Arabia with my soldiers. Being confident of this one thing, Paul said, being confident of this very thing, he that began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And the, and the song was, He who began a good work in you, will be faithful to complete it, faithful to complete it in you. See? That's kind of the way, kind of the, way the song went. We used to sing that in the desert. Because, you know, if God started the work in you, He will finish it. You're not going to be unfinished. When His coming, you'll be finished. Spirit, soul, and body, finished. You'll be prepared for heaven, the life in heaven, life with the Lord. You're not right now. You can't go to heaven the way you are right now. You just can't. <laughs> Would you like that anyway? You know? The last part, we'll get through. 
These are closing remarks where Paul requests prayer for himself and also that this epistle be read to all. Verses 25 through 28. Brethren, pray for us. Greet the brethren. Paul's used the word prayer three times in this lesson. Pray for us this time. He said, pray for us, our, my team, Timothy and others with me. Greet the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you that the, by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the brethren. And then he ends like he started. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The holy kiss. You might want to spend the whole time on that Sunday morning. But here's what it is. The holy kiss in the ancient world has been, was a normal and accepted greeting. A kiss. Usually between men and men, women and women. A kiss. It was a, that was acceptable. Today the standard greeting is a handshake. That was before you know COVID. <laughs> a handshake. Alright. And then, but today... A light embrace is probably more in keeping with the holy kiss of Scripture. A br embrace, you know, and that would be men with men, women with women. And I get, and I, and I can, I can give hugs to older women. You know, they like and older women like you to hug them. It's okay, Tommy. You can hug them. But you know, what's wrong with that? It helps you, don't it? People, people need that. Some people in our church don't have any chance to be with anybody. They come to church on Sunday morning. Really, especially older people, we ought to be up there greeting them, giving them a hug, letting them know that you're glad to see them. Human touch. Right. So I remember, and I close, uh, I remember when I went to Ecuador with Johnny, you know, Johnny, is it Johnny Mass? Our missionary down there in Ecuador? Moss or Mass, Johnny? And his wife uh, was down there, and I got to preach in some of the little churches they had. And what was sweet, and I'd never seen this before, the little girls, they were little girls, nobody else, but the little girls would come up and give me a kiss. I'd have to bend down, you know, they, would, they wanted to give you a kiss right here. And that was really sweet, but that was part of their culture, you know. So really, Paul, what does that mean? It means show affection. Do you have any kind of love and compassion? Show affection. And people really need that. We all need it. We all need it. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for the, the wonderful word that you give us that brings us, uh, help us the joy that it brings us, uh, meaning and purpose. We do pray you'll take what we've heard. Let, let us open our heart to those things and let us ponder those things and to our heart and the things you teach us. We pray that you'll make a source of blessing to us and help us to be what we should be with others in our, in our community, in, our, in the body of Christ here in our local church. Help us to be recognizing our pastor in ways that where he needs prayer, he needs encouragement. We pray that we'll be remembering that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.